This presentation examines if nuclear power is globally scalable. Is it the answer to the world's impending energy needs? My name is Derek Abbott from the University of Adelaide, Australia. My office is in the building on the right. Let's discuss why we might need nuclear power. This graph shows a 10,000 year time span and the tiny blip in the middle is mankind's fossil fuel consumption. The fossil fuel epoch is tiny on a large scale and that's why we need alternative power fast. Some people deny that oil will last only 40 years, and extremists even say it will last 10,000 years. I can go one better than the extremists. My law of resource depletion says oil lasts forever. If you don't use it, that's the point. You can make all finite resources last thousands of years if you drastically reduce our present consumption and bring down our annual growth rates to nearly zero. For those who still don't accept this, there are two further arguments. Burning fuels creates enormous emissions. Burning fuels is irreversible. You don't get them back. But can nuclear energy come to the rescue and solve these global issues? Presently, in 2010, there are about 440 commercial nuclear reactors worldwide. To match the world's current energy consumption would require a scale-up of about 15,000 new reactors. To see what this means in terms of land use, take the USA. To meet all of the US electricity needs, you need to scale up to about 4,000 reactors. I challenge you to now put 4,000 dots on this map that are in proximity to volumes of coolant water and in locations where you are not going to get lawsuits. In fact, you'd be doing well if you can even draw a hundred dots. I challenge anyone to get any map of any country and try this. There simply aren't enough strategic locations. Waste. The nuclear industry tells us that waste can now be safely stored without any problems. They have strict controls and have it all organized by guys in yellow hats. But isn't this statement rather like the one that claimed the Titanic would never sink? How can you possibly guarantee safe storage in 10,000 years? What about unexpected seismic activity? What if a presently politically stable country goes into chaos in 50 years time? It is this waste issue that causes poor public acceptance and makes nuclear politically unpopular. Imagine the levels of public protest we would invite if the world scaled up to 15,000 reactors. This protest t-shirt makes the point that anything mankind does that is irreversible always creates problems for future generations. Reliability. The containment metals that the nuclear vessel are made from all corrode and crack with age. This is worsened by the high energy neutrons that bombard the metal surfaces, increasing the rate of cracking. This is called neutron embrittlement. It is these cracks that cause safety and reliability issues and eventually plant shutdown. This is why nuclear plants have a useful lifetime of only 30 to 40 years. If you globally scale up to 15,000 reactors, one has to count the enormous investment in plant rebuilding in 40-year cycles. As we shall see, this simply isn't sustainable. It costs six billion to build a typical reactor and another six billion to close it down at the end of its life. In 1979, the cleanup job after Three Mile Island in the US was about a billion dollars. Can we afford these types of costs? At present, there is a centralized nuclear incident reporting system coordinated by the Nuclear Energy Authority, and 70 incidents are reported every year. Well, these are just the ones reported. These are minor reliability incidents, such as corroded pipes and electronic sensors that need replacement. But if we scale up to 15,000 reactors worldwide, that's five incidents a day. Couple this with natural human error, then it doesn't take long to have a major leakage incident. At present rates of consumption, the World Nuclear Association projects that we only have 80 years of uranium using conventional nuclear reactors. So if we ran the whole world off nuclear tomorrow, there would only be five years left. Is this long enough to justify selling one soul to the devil? Nuclear advocates reply to this by saying that fast breeder reactors, or FBRs, extend uranium life by a factor of 60. Also, if we extract uranium from seawater and throw thorium fuel into the mix, we have well over a thousand years of power. Ah, a nuclear utopia for the foreseeable future. Let's now examine if this is true. 
The question that has been neglected is to ask what materials the nuclear vessel itself is made of. Slugs, snails, and puppy dogs' tails? Well, almost. It turns out a whole host of exotic rare metals are used to control and contain the nuclear reaction. For example, hafnium is a neutron absorber, beryllium a neutron reflector, zirconium is used for cladding, lithium hydride as blanket layer, and many of the other exotics are used to alloy steel to make it last 40 years against neutron cracking. Then, one has to recognize that these exotic metals have many other important industrial uses. For example, niobium is used in superalloys for aircraft engines and in surgical steel for medicine. That is why the annual growth rate in consumption in the fourth column is higher for these exotics than even for oil. Thus, in the fifth column, it is not surprising that the extinction times for these resources is much faster than oil. Remember, this is based on present growth rates. If we now attempt to build 15,000 nuclear stations, we exhaust these materials even faster. Remember, these figures do not predict absolute extinction times. If, for political or economic reasons, we stop using a resource, it will last forever. We cannot predict that. What we are showing are relative extinction times compared to oil, assuming present annual growth rates in consumption. And at present rates for known reserves, nuclear power is much more endangered than oil. Nuclear is thus not the solution to the oil problem. It also shows that the claim that FBRs will create a 10,000 year nuclear utopia is false. Because we simply do not have the containment materials to support building enough power stations to do the job. There are two types of nuclear advocate, the utopian and the realist. This presentation disproved the claims of a nuclear utopia lasting thousands of years. A nuclear realist, however, will acknowledge there are scaling limits to nuclear power and therefore only claims the world should be building 10 to 20 reactors each year for the next 50 years and agrees that 15,000 is impossible. The realist will say these few extra reactors are part of the needed energy policy mix of the future. But this is complete double talk, as it diminishes the urgency of building nuclear stations. A few extra reactors is only a small slice of the global energy pie and makes little difference in the grand scheme of things. Is it wise to invest the many billions in even these small numbers of reactors? and lock in our investment into a dead-end technology, aren't we better off putting that same amount of money into developing renewable resources that truly last forever? What about nuclear fusion? Can that save the day? Apart from the fact that it doesn't exist, the nuclear vessel still suffers from cracking due to high-energy neutrons. But wait, everybody has a fusion reactor in their backyard. Can you see where it is hiding? Yes, of course, it's the sun, Mother Nature's own fusion reactor. It's reliable, it's safe, and the solar energy that hits the ground is 5,000 times our global energy needs. It is enormous. Why should we invest in artificial nuclear resources when nature provides us with God's own nuclear reactor delivered straight to our doorsteps? Finally, let's get some perspective. This chart shows the relative abundance of elements in the Earth's crust. The ones at the top are a billion times more abundant than the ones on the bottom. The elements you need to collect solar energy all happen to be in the high end, and the exotic metals needed to support nuclear power are in the low end. Which would you prefer to invest in? Secondly, if you burn a resource, you can't recycle it, and so it follows the bottom curve by eventually running down. The middle curve is what happens if you use solar energy. The graph goes horizontal and carries on forever. That's what we mean when we talk about free energy from the sun. Which of these two curves would you rather invest in? So why aren't we getting into action and doing something about all this? As the US geophysicist M. King Hubbard once said, our ignorance is not so vast as our failure to use what we know. We have simply failed to properly think through the issues and put into action what we know. Now is the time to change.
If you enjoyed this presentation and want to find out more how to implement solar energy in an effective way, type the reference below into Google.